Before we get started, just a quick note, spoiler alert. And we are adults, and I will try very hard not to use adult language, but this is the warning. Hello and welcome to Fright Bites. My name is Jennifer. And I'm Serena. Each episode, we will feature a short story or novella. You can read along with us by finding the full reading list posted on our website, lastlibraryontheleft.com, or our social media at LLOTL Podcast. So today we're talking about the first in a duo titled The Murders of Molly Southbourne, and it's by Tay Thompson, published in 2017 by Tor.com. The summary reads, for as long as Molly Southbourne can remember, she's been watching herself die. Whenever she bleeds, another Molly is born, identical to her in every way and intent on her destruction. Molly knows every way to kill herself, but she also knows that as long as she survives, she'll be hunted. No matter how well she follows the rules, eventually the Mollies will find her. Can Molly find a way to stop the tide of blood, or will she meet her end at the hand of a girl who looks just like her? So, uh, <laughs> sometimes I should really read the summaries because that little last sentence, will she meet her end at the hand of a girl who looks just like her? I didn't even think about that until now. Yeah, I don't read summaries. So I'm that person that doesn't look at puzzle boxes when I'm doing a puzzle. I don't read summaries when I'm reading a book. Mm-hmm. I am very much that <laughs> terrible librarian who will judge a book by its cover. And... <laughs> Right? Because like, I yeah. will, I'm not gonna lie. That's actually how I chose this book. Yeah. The cover for this one, I really, really liked. I don't know what I was expecting when I went in, but I knew that I liked the cover. I didn't read any of these summaries. I may have skimmed through them, but I was like, we're talking about them anyway. So I don't need to read the summary because I'm reading the book. I think typically I read through summaries and kind of skim through the book a little bit. But yeah, you're right. The cover for this was really awesome. Oddly enough, we were talking about your house is on fire and your children all gone. Mm-hmm. So the reason I chose that one when I was skimming the freebie shelf at MIT mm-hmm. was because I recognized the line from mm-hmm. a nursery rhyme. I didn't have any clue what it was going to be. So I pulled it off the shelf and then the mm-hmm. cover is like a lot. <laughs> yeah, the cover is a lot. <laughs> and I took it home and I started it on the train and got a few pages and it was like, that's okay. I could put this down. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You have to put it down. Yeah. <laughs> and put it back in my bag. But yeah, asked my mom about it. I was like, mom, where's this line from? And she said it was from a nursery rhyme that was like, ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. Your house is on fire. Your children all gone. And I was like, what the hell? Why do I know that nursery rhyme? And she yeah. was like, I don't know. <laughs> Because we know these crazy nursery rhymes. That's so gross. I don't like Mm -hmm. it. Anyway, so I just wanted to say I'm not a summary reader. I absolutely judge books by covers. In the Molly Southbourne series, the covers are so simple, but Mm -hmm. so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think the covers kind of give you a little insight into the story, too. They're just very well done. I really like the covers of the books. I like both of these books a lot. I'm not sure which one is my favorite out of the two, but I like them both a lot for entirely different reasons. Yeah, I think I like The Murders of Molly Southbourne for the psychological and mystery element of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're constantly trying to figure out. Also, I got really into the retelling of Molly's history Mm -hmm. and forgot that she was holding a Molly hostage. So I totally did not catch on to the fact that she had a Molly hostage until the end. And I was like, wait a minute, what? (laughs) (laughs) And so I must have just read over that part. I don't, or maybe I was just so engrossed in the story like you, I just forgot about it because it was a good story. Her history was really, really good. Her history was really intense. And even the sort of mystery surrounding her parents was really Mm -hmm. intense. But yeah, I totally forgot because it does. It starts off with a Molly telling the story Mm -hmm. and then Molly coming in and being like, sit down, shut up. Let me tell you a story. Yeah. (laughs) And she like Mm -hmm. tells the story, but you get so engrossed with Molly's story that you forgot that a Molly started it. Yeah. Until the very end. And then I was like, whoa. That was a whole one-two punch there. Yeah. I thought that Molly's mom was a badass. I thought Molly was a badass. And I wanted more of the mom history a little bit. Mm. Just because I wanted to know why she was so adamant that Molly had to kill the clone Molly's. Which we get that in the second. So I was glad to get that in the second book. Uh, One of the things that I wrote and I texted you was this book when I was reading it reminded me of the movie The Ugly 
Party, which is from either Australian or New Zealand. But it's about a guy named Simon, I believe. And he is haunted by these things called the Uglies. And they're telling him to kill. But once he kills, he gets a temporary relief. Mm. But the Uglies are those he has previously killed. Mm. It's a psychological horror from way back when. And I loved it. But I was instantly, I thought, (laughs) this is the ugly in book form and with the female. (laughs) That's what it reminded me of. This book, for some reason, took me back to a lot of books that I read as a child. The Point Horror, R.L. Stein, Christopher Pike type novels hmm. with the female lead. Like there's one specific book series by Christopher Pike that's a vampire series. And the lead character in there, she's just trying to live a normal life. But she's a vampire who's been living for centuries and she's got all these enemies that have come up. And so like amidst her trying to get married and have a baby, she's just <laughs> she's fighting all these things. And I kept thinking about her and Molly because Molly's just trying to figure out how to get to a normal life. Yeah. Molly is the, I think, stereotypical epitome of the shelter child trying to just see a bit more of the world, but also holding on to the securities that her parents have taught her. It's just that Molly's securities are more extreme there. You know, Mm -hmm. her mantra is blot, burn, bleach. (laughs) which is crazy. Okay, so I guess we should tell you guys, Molly has a condition Mm -hmm. that if she bleeds, even just one drop of her blood will consume the matter around it and regenerate into another Molly, but like a Molly with a lowercase m. So the very first time Molly remembers a Molly coming is when she was little and she cut herself on the riverbank. Mm Mm-hmm. And she went to bed that night. And when she woke up later that night, a little a Molly like her was mm-hmm. naked in the bedroom and it had regenerated at the riverbank. And she was so like pleased to have <laughs> another child to play with <laughs> that she didn't tell her parents, even though she knew something weird was going on. Mm-hmm. And so she kept the Molly in the room. And for a few days, it was kind of normal and is as normal as hiding a duplicate of yourself can <laughs> be from your family. <laughs> But one night the Molly got like a different look in its eyes. Like it was becoming more self-aware that Mm -hmm. in a very Highlander sense, there can only be one. Yeah. (laughs) And the Molly attacked her, like tried to crush her head. And the mom and dad came in and they killed the Molly Mm -hmm. and they wiped up all the blood, took care of everything. But it was, it like gave her a sense of, oh, that's why you blot, burn, bleach the blood because the Mollies are dangerous. Yeah. But even reading the first one, I was like, but it was a child, you know, Mm -hmm. what and the Mollies regenerate with her memories to an extent, you know, I was like, why did the Molly attack her the first time? Did it grow to understand that it was being kept in the room and that it meant that it wasn't, I don't know, it made me wonder, like, did it become self-aware enough that Mm -hmm. it got jealous of her and it realized that there could only be one Molly? Yeah. And so it was going to kill her so that it could be the Molly that would take over. Yeah. Was it because it somehow already knew that the parents had already murdered other Mollies? Because that's the first Molly you know of as the reader right but there had to have been blood before, before that i don't know it was weird i i couldn't understand why the first molly attacked and then it became even more stressful to try to understand why the first molly attacked in the second book but that's a whole other discussion <laughs> right and then she just continually prepped herself to attack them before they attacked her mm-hmm. although if i remember correctly there were some scenes where she experimented sexually with some of them too yeah and- she she was dating her professor mm-hmm. and she had bled I think somewhere on the floor of his room mm-hmm. and didn't realize it and it regenerated in the room and so mm-hmm. when it like came to be they all just had a threesome but then she yeah. like murdered it right after right yeah <laughs> This was a engrossing book. I just thought that was interesting because I wasn't sure how that played into it where she could experience pleasure with the Molly, but at the same instance, kill the Molly Mm -hmm. and be prepped to kill a Molly, but just, well, I'm in the throes of passion. So just join us for now and we'll see about the rest later. Because she was almost robotic in the way she took care of the Molly. So this kind of threw me off when she had that one little scene. I was like, what? (laughs) So as I was reading it, you very clearly can tell that Mm -hmm. it's body horror, psychological Mm -hmm. horror, Mm -hmm. things like that. But I was thinking about the Mollies that she kills and that she's killing Mm -hmm. versions of herself 
and she's really detached from those versions of herself yeah recognizing that they are her but that they're below her in a way and so I began to wonder if it was like a analogy of womanhood and what it means to have yeah you know like what it means to have sexuality as a woman Mm -hmm. you know a sexual drive a very either intense sexual drive for some women or no sexual drive for other women or something in between yeah and Molly had a very intense sexual drive she did yeah and so I wonder if part of that was the social construct of killing that part of her to repress the sexual drive because it wasn't just about sex with the professor she was also using him for his biological Mm -hmm. understanding of herself yeah and how to either figure out why she produces molly's stop it from happening and because it just seemed like they were not 100 clones of her somewhere along the way the experiment was done wrong in the cloning process that's what i kept thinking about the cloned what was it the sheep or the lamb Mm -hmm, dolly yeah dolly and i kept thinking like along the way there were experiments that went wrong so this is just that sort of same sort of situation they're not 100 molly because it was like asexual reproduction yeah you know the fact that molly wanted to experience life live life like a normal person but was mechanically and militantly taught to murder versions of herself that were trying to harm her. I don't know. I kept thinking, is this an attempt to understand the multifaceted female mind in which we repress or in some extreme cases, kill off parts of ourselves that are deemed unacceptable by greater social constructs? Oh, I really like that analysis because I think in a way, yeah. And the only reason I say that is because I have some notes for the second book that we can't Mm. go into. But I think that is Tay Thompson's way of shaping and symbolizing the issues that women deal with in society from small to adulthood and Mm -hmm. still trying to maintain the status quo that is expected of them or was expected of them. We are quickly shattering all of those expectations. And we'll continue to shatter them as long as they quit making it illegal. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, I was thinking too about, because not every murder of a Molly is an intense fight scene in the book. The first one is in her adolescence with the River Molly. And I began to think about the research that shows that uh, female bullying Mm -hmm. can start to occur as early as first and second grade, that like kind of clicky queen bee behavior. And that psychologist talk about how it starts so young but that it can also be avoided and that Mm -hmm. female friendships and things like that are really close and can be nurturing but that we're taught as women there's not enough space for women in society to succeed Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. every woman is your competition yeah and so if in those early years when girls are excelling above boys in school because boys don't mature as fast then now we're trying to take out our competition early yeah so I was wondering like is that what this is is this that time where the Molly understood this is competition for the parents. And then the next really big one that I remember was when she ran away to the city and was at the library yeah. and met a boy for the mm-hmm. first time. And that was another instance of a really intense confrontation with another Molly. All of these big moments in Molly's life when she has to come into direct opposition with herself. And I think that's what Tade was trying to do. I think this was actually really well done. I think it was maybe a little abstract. I agree with you. When I was reading, I was like, why didn't I read this sooner? And so (laughs) so I really did like it. And as a woman reading it, I don't feel like it was making fun of like in any way, right? It wasn't poking fun of females in Mm -hmm. any type of way, shape or form. At least that's what I feel. It was an honest Mm -hmm. attempt at symbolizing something that we all deal with, but viewing it from the outside lens and trying to reinterpret that into the written form. Yes. And I think in the first book, I finished the first book and I felt dissatisfied with the conclusion because it felt like he was so close to understanding this dynamic within us and what we struggle with every day and I was like ugh, it was almost there but then book two I read and I was like you know what this came back around and I Mm -hmm. think the Molly Southbourne series while it was not what I was expecting it was really really good yeah I don't know what I expected from the second one but what I got was not what I expected but that doesn't mean I like it any less because I really did enjoy 
enjoy both of these. The first one, if it had ended the way it ended, I think I would have been fine. Yeah. Because it was such a shock to me at the end. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was okay interpreting what I believe to be the epilogue afterwards. But I am very glad that I did get the second one because that's not what I would have thought of. <laughs> The ending of the first one was so chaotic, but felt so <laughs> familiar in a way where by the end of all of Molly's trials, she's trapped a Molly, tied her to a chair and has told her the story. And she's like, look, I've tried doing this a couple of times. What I'm telling you is this is the life I lead and I'm done. Yeah. You get to pick up the mantle. And if you want to be Molly now, you're Molly. Yeah. She's like, but I'm not Molly anymore. She's like, how do you feel? And the Molly was like, well, I don't have have an unending rage and need to murder you so I mm. guess I could be Molly <laughs> like I guess I want this life and Molly was like cool I'm gonna go die now and so Molly like lit fire to her home mm -hmm. and then walked into a room with all the other murderous Mollies that she couldn't get through to was either murdered by them or consumed by the fire or they were all died at the same time by the fire yeah but to me reading that scene I was like wow what an interesting because I was already like in this mindset mm -hmm. of how we traumatize ourselves, how we hurt ourselves to become yeah. like what society thinks we should be or what we mm -hmm. think society wants from us. And I was like, what a violent way to try to end intergenerational trauma, but like through yourself? Yeah. You know, she took yeah. all these traumatic mollies and was like, we're burning this system to the ground, this broken system. Mm -hmm. And hopefully what I've taught the next molly will help the future and I was like this is such a like body gore manifestation mm -hmm. of intergenerational trauma that's so you <laughs> we had this conversation in cabin in the woods <laughs> you'll burn the system down and start fresh <laughs> yes yeah I will <laughs> I think that even though I was a little disappointed with the mm -hmm. ending because mm -hmm. the original Molly had to sacrifice herself, all of yeah. her trauma, yeah, herself and her trauma and couldn't herself be better, even mm -hmm. though she wanted to be, she had to hope that the next generation of Molly would be better. Yeah. That felt so sad, mm -hmm. but kind of uplifting too. Yeah, I would agree because she wasn't giving up by no means. It was plan B for her, I think. Mm. I was a little sad by the same time having understood Molly having understood her mom because her mom was the one who was training her as a child which of course it's the mom that's always the mom um <laughs> the fact that the mom was training her and she only knew one path which was the destructional mm. path which again that's kind of interesting because moms are more nurturing usually oh that, but yeah no Molly's dad was the more nurturing one right so yeah so to see that role reversal was interesting as well but yeah just to see the way she was raised and how she was handling all the mollies I don't want to say I expected it but it was one that I could appreciate for her character because mm -hmm. that molly was different than the lowercase m molly we disagree on the ending a little bit but at the same time I still <laughs> like the second book too and I felt like I needed the second book even though I didn't know I needed it you know I always forget that the mom in a way was just as abusive mm -hmm. because the mom never encouraged getting to know the molly like she very much lived with the mindset of the military and spy network mm -hmm. that she herself was raised in and she passed that down to her own daughter even though her daughter was not growing up in the exact same environment and that's how intergenerational trauma works mm -hmm. so right, she, and it was always that one solution it was never try to find a different way out right it was you were taught to be a soldier and to obey even after marrying that man and being nurtured by him mm -hmm. and their romance sounded so kind of beautiful and cliche yeah <laughs> and the fact that she couldn't apply that sense of adoration to her own daughter and mm -hmm. to treat her daughter like a soldier instead felt really, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to go with. It was a look at intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. and how women have to harm themselves mm -hmm. and resist being themselves in order to be what they think they should be. Yeah, I think that's an accurate description and accurate portrayal because we all, any female will tell you that's legit how it is for us. That's just how it is from small yeah. but it was a good read man yeah I blew through this one real fast I think that we're ready to talk about the second book because we really need to talk about it so we're gonna have to say goodbye to you guys and yeah. we gotta talk about the second one because I don't know how much more I can hold my mouth right and I'm gonna blow your mind oh I can't wait <laughs> I can't 
can't wait either because that's what all the tip of my tongue <laughs> but yeah we'll see y'all tomorrow for the next episode of the fright bites where we talk about the second book bye guys bye. oh i can't wait for the second one okay <laughs> <laughs>